The end of the world is on people's minds. We have the power to destroy or save ourselves, but the question is, what do you do with that responsibility? Time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Amos tossed and turned as he heard a faint noise from the roof, and then a pattering noise against the windows above his head. There were blinds and heavy curtains over them, and it'd be pitch black outside anyway. He woke just a little more with the thought that the weather forecast hadn't called for rain, and certainly not hail. This sounded like one of those late spring storms, almost. The wind should have been howling, well, nothing he could do about the weather, so he turned over and fell back into a fitful slumber full of nightmares. His crops were ruined and the fields lay barren before him, his animals injured, all of the bleeding creatures lowed and bleated and whined piteously, and looked to him for succor, but there was nothing he could do to help. The flesh melted from their frames and puddled below their skeletal forms, that stared accusingly at him with red, radiant eyes. He woke in alarm, well, to an alarm. Farm hours were long. In addition to his normal output, he had to tend to additional fields of crops meant for a starving world across the ocean. This season he was unable to leave any fallow fields. Everything had to be sown and harvested. There had been a plague of locusts from Africa to Pakistan toward the end of the winter season, and it had now spread to western China and north into the Mediterranean basin. The plant life was devastated. Between that and the Australian and Brazilian wildfires, and panic over an unrelated pandemic, food production and transportation had slowed to dangerous levels. The world was hungry, and the wilderness suffered. It was up to the few remaining farm belts to feed the rest. He would do his part, though his farm was a small one. He puttered about in the kitchen until his daughter and two sons finally came stumbling down the stairs. His wife had died last summer, so his workload had increased exponentially. Well, the kids were out for spring break, so he'd had free help with the planting. He'd show them mercy after the day and let them enjoy the one free weekend before they had to go back to studying and working full time. Good morning. Hope you all got some rest last night. Anyone else get woken up by the rainstorm? Amos asked his small brood as they each moved about the kitchen, procuring what they wanted for breakfast. He had given up trying to cook for his own plague of locusts. Well, he'd stop calling them that, even jokingly after the threat of global famine had become a reality, but he couldn't help what crossed his mind. I didn't hear anything, his daughter, the middle child, piped. Well, I was tired, though, and stayed up watching videos and chatting. His oldest son just shrugged. Ah, I didn't really pay attention. Rain puts me deeper asleep, though. The youngest boy didn't answer, just settled down to a bowl of cold cereal, his earbuds already blocking out sounds of the real world. Amos didn't bother prompting him, he knew that one had been playing online games for most of the night. He'd have been wearing headphones and staring at a bright screen in his otherwise darkened room. Nathan, unlike his older brother, Amos Jr., AJ, was not personable with anyone who was not in his gaming circles or for whom he had no immediate need. Amos sighed. He was fortunate in his kids. They got along well enough, but each was self-sufficient. As far as he could tell, they were developing well. Nathan was 13, and he'd develop his skills and the direction he wanted to go with time. His detachment seemed normal for his generation more of an attachment to machines than to his fellow humans. Well, we plant the last little bit today, and then, if we get done in time, I'll take you all to an early supper in town. Then you'll be cut loose until Sunday evening. Amos grinned around the table, and each of the kids, even Nathan, smiled back. Apparently he could hear after all. At least, when he chose to. It had been a tough year. A tough couple of years with Glenda first sick and then he didn't want to think about that. Amos took his piece of toast over to the kitchen door and out onto the back porch to finish eating. He liked to look at the farm, his farm, 
First thing in the morning while the dew was fresh, and he had time to listen to birdsong and the twitters and clicks of insects. So calm, so peaceful, so reassuring to his mind that all was right with the world. This morning, there was no bird song. The animals were quiet. Usually the cows and nanny goats would be letting him know that it was time for milking. The dogs would be gambling up to the porch for a quick scratch and then leftovers for their own breakfast. Chickens and ducks would be strutting and waddling about, scratching for anything good to eat. Come to think of it, the rooster hadn't made a sound. Then, with the brightening sunlight, he noticed the yard and the close-by field. They were barren, utterly devoid of greenery, no leaves and buds, grass of the lawn was cut down to the soil, and the field, the field was gone, nothing but dirt. He looked around the porch and then walked quickly around the house. Nothing was left of the natural world but greys and browns. And then, below the window to his bedroom, he saw them, bodies just inches long. Locusts. Valentina enjoyed taking care of her plants on the terrace. The condo she shared with her partner, Pete, sat high above most of the city, and it was refreshing to take the morning air and look out on the town she loved so well. It had been a warm night, so she'd slept peacefully to the roar of the air conditioning that hummed and kept her restfully cool in their king-size bed. Peter just left for work, and she was halfway through her first cup of coffee, anticipating her morning chores as she thought of taking care of the few outdoor, very domesticated plants. She took the last sips, and then filled her little watering bucket with the big sunflowers on the sides. Pete rushed back inside the elevators. He had to get to Valentina. He had to warn her. When he'd left the parking garage, there'd been groups of people standing around on the sidewalks, instead of the white-collar minions purposefully marching towards their endeavours for the day. They all stood gawking and pointing. Some stood silently in shock. Others spoke excitedly either to the people around them or into their devices. The remaining few wailed and cried out in horror. Pete stared himself, mouth agape. For as far as he could see, the plant life had been devastated. Not a piece of green remained. Even the trees with softer barks had been stripped. The car pulled in behind him and the driver honked impatiently. Pete exited the garage, carefully made the block and returned to his designated space in the garage. The view had been the same from every side of the complex. Greys and browns predominated, except where humans had left a few colourful marks of their own. It was worse than the most severe winter. Even the evergreens, the shrubs, they were all bare. There were no lingering patches of green among the grassy spaces. Just soil, dry or moist from the sprinklers. It was all equally barren. He rushed down the hallway to their doors and entered. He knew that Valentina would be devastated, but he also knew that it may be dangerous for her to be out on the terrace. He had no idea what had happened, but it had to be toxic. When he entered the living room, he looked across and saw her. She stood there at the French doors that led to the terrace, her curve silhouetted in the morning light. A little water bucket with the gaudy flowers on the side lay spilled at her feet. She just stared at where her lovely plants had been, and out beyond, where the city had been green with late spring. Young Eduardo, Eddie to his friends, looked up at Jorge, the larger boy who'd been secretly bullying him for the entire school year. Definitely not a friend, he thought desperately. Jorge had gotten a growth spurt earlier than most of his contemporaries, and had taken full advantage of it. This morning had been hot, and Jorge had been particularly irritable. Eddie had gotten in his way somehow, and landed in the crosshairs of his pre-adolescent fury. 
now he faced the consequences as the bigger boy pushed him for the second time in this latest tirade. One more shove and Eddie would be against the wall in a little travelled area of the schoolyard, out of sight of any potential rescuers. Several other kids stood around, encouraging one or the other, mostly Jorge. Almost all of them aimed phones at the scene that unfolded this hot spring morning. They weren't particularly loud, though. No one wanted a teacher or staff member to interrupt their fun. Eddie thought he was hearing things. Maybe his ears had that roaring he felt when he panicked. Maybe Jorge had already knocked him cold. Maybe this was just a dream. No, he definitely heard a loud buzz. A humming buzz. A roaring buzz. Then he looked up and saw the strange-looking cloud that moved in an odd, swirling manner towards them. He dropped to the ground in a fetal ball. The crowd around him just laughed, and Jorge drew back his leg to deliver a contemptuous kick. Then one of the kids screamed, and another yelled out for the rest to, Look! as she pointed into the mid-morning sky. Above them, and approaching quickly, was a cloud, a shadow that moved swiftly toward them. The buzzing chitter that had become very apparent emanated from that swarm. A few of the young people ran, and others joined Eddie on the ground and huddled in abject terror as the locusts swarmed over and ate every bit of vegetation in view. Sanya Liu, reporting here. We've been hearing for a few months now about plagues of locusts from all around the world. Apparently many are attributing the insect invasions to some sort of ancient divine punishment. At this, she rolled her eyes in obvious contempt. The invasive creatures have literally taken a bite out of the planet's farmlands, at least in the less developed parts of the world. Until recently, the Americas seemed like a safe haven, protected from the invasive species by the wide oceans to either side. Yet now, we look to our south and find that the croplands in Mexico have been devastated. Areas along the border, the rich growing lands from California to the Rio Grande Valley, have been hit by waves of the devouring little creatures. According to the Department of Agriculture, pesticides seem to have no effect on them. Small communities have suffered the most. As so far, we urbanistas seem to be safe. Apparently these bugs prefer to eat blue-collar fare at the county buffet. She sniggered a little and passed the platform back to the studio team. Wow! exclaimed Leah Cole, the studio anchor. Looks like the rural folk will be eaten out of their trailer parks. Oh, hey, on to something less depressing. It turns out that the hip-hop artist Biggie S has been seen out with actress... The enormous swarms moved ever northward with the warming onset of summer. Within a month, they were destroying the green places of southern Canada. Then, like a light switch, the devastation stopped. The insects did not die off, at least. There were no piles of desiccated little corpses in evidence. They simply disappeared. Literally went off the radar. It was just as well. They cleared a swathe from sea to shining sea and had done the same across the world, leaving nowhere unaffected. Almost nothing was left. The world would soon be on the brink of starvation, of a famine like nothing in the memory of the human species. Nothing since the last great extinction. Amos had aged dramatically in the two months since the locust had invaded. He was lean to the point of gauntness, and his hair had begun to grey. The kids were doing better than him, yet everyone had a hollow-eyed look. They had grain stored, but only enough to feed a handful of animals and to replant a small field or two. They'd butchered all of the animals they couldn't feed. When the freezers were full, they'd reopened an old root cellar from his grandfather's time and filled it with summer sausage and cheese. The last remaining fire animals were those that provided milk. They were given the grain. The chickens and ducks remained, though their egg production was nearly nil. The dogs had disappeared. They had been eating bits of meat along with the rest of the family, but not everyone or everything in the area ate so well, 
and the dogs were nice and sleek. In the summer, most grass had returned. A few trees sprouted leaves from buds that had not yet sprung before the attack. Yet the dry heat and the winds had turned much of the topsail to dust, that now blew haphazardly and piled like drifts of snow when it wasn't choking the life from them. They worked with their neighbours, and the community struggled onwards. Commerce, as they'd known it for their lives up to this point, was over and done. They traded among one another out in the countryside, but did not dare risk wasting food by sending it to the city. Pete and Valentina struck out just as the madness fell upon the city. They drove as far as they could, and when they could no longer get gasoline, they proceeded on foot. They were headed for the coast. Pete had reasoned that at least sea life would not have been affected. Valentina had agreed with as much enthusiasm as she'd been able to muster since the locusts had changed their world. Their enthusiasm plummeted when they had to leave behind most of their belongings. They were already hungry and on short rations before they escaped the outlying suburbs of the next large city. They tried to skirt around it, since they could see the plumes of smoke and hear the sounds of madness and butchery. They were almost clear of the population centre when they encountered the township. Even here, in the distant suburbs, people had already eaten the food available, and then the pets. They would not resorted to other meat for the most part, though. Every little settlement had its secrets. A group of township citizens greeted them as they approached a barricade across the highway that passed through the micro-city. Welcome, friends. A tall man who, looked as though he'd already been lean before the plague struck, held up his hand, open palm facing them. He carried a rifle in the crook of his other elbow, and the other three gate guards were equally well armed. Are you folks coming from the city? Valentina looked annoyed, and Pete could tell that she was about to say something snarky that would likely garner a negative response from the townsfolk. They were tired, hungry, and dirty, and they'd walked all that day to get to this place that looked a little better tended than anything else they'd seen so far. He lifted the very nice leather bag from his shoulder and set it on the ground. Uh, good evening. My name's Pete. This is Valentina. We ran out of gas and we've been walking all day. We're almost out of food. Is there any chance we could shelter with you for the night? We'd be willing to work for our supper. I'm an attorney and Valentina here is great with raising plants. I'm sure she could offer useful advice on growing, um, anything that's left. He finished lamely and with no help from his partner. Valentina darted a glance at him but remained silent. The lean man nodded and gestured for them to stay in place. He consulted with the rest of the group for a moment, and then walked back towards them wearing a smile. Look, we don't have much, but we are willing to share. We still have power and water, and we have several nice homes that have been abandoned. You'd be welcome to stay in any one of them. The food situation is tough, but I think we can get you some uh, community soup. It's what we make from donations by members of the township. He used a radio that looked like a police model to contact someone. A female voice answered, and shortly a pair of women arrived, and along with them, two of the erstwhile road guards, who escorted them to a nice little cottage a few blocks further into a settled area, near to the police station. The elder, matronly-looking woman, with the librarian's glasses, had carried a small bowl, which she presented to Valentina. Oh, I'm so sorry it's not bowl, but this is what we have. I hope you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the township. Make yourselves at home and get some rest. The couple thanked the township citizens, who greeted them so kindly, and entered their new dwelling. It was still furnished, though it looked as though the inhabitants had left hastily. There was no food to be found anywhere. Doubtless the residents had taken it, and the good citizens of the township had scrounged for any leftovers. Out of curiosity, Pete switched on the television, a nice modern model. There was nothing to see on most channels. He found a news channel, though, and sat down to find out what was happening in the world. Nothing good. Valentina sat down beside him and offered him a bite of the soup. He took a couple of slurps and urged her to eat the rest. 
He opened his designer leather bag that had once been filled with legal documents he thought essential and took out one of their last remaining candy bars. They'd found a miraculously unraided vending machine in an abandoned office building and had taken the remaining items. Valentina munched on the soup, which consisted mostly of tiny chunks of meat and salty water. The news broadcast seemed to be a recorded message that had been left running in a loop. It appears as though the insect plague, the locusts, may have started in desert regions around the world. Perhaps buried beneath the sands of time, waiting to emerge and devour all before them. This strain is previously unknown. No laboratory has come up with what they truly are. We named them locusts just to simplify the terminology. And so far no pesticides have worked. Even natural predators like birds seem to dislike eating these creatures. As it stands, the world will be hungry for some time yet. Many areas of the world have already sunken into extreme famine conditions. Valentina nudged him. They said that the water works. Maybe we can get a shower and find some clean clothes. They found that there were still plenty of clothes in the closet of the master bedroom. Valentina picked out a bright pink nightgown and Pete located a pair of shorts and a clean t-shirt. They showered and then crawled beneath the sheets for some long overdue rest. They were exhausted and slept deeply, more so than usual. Well, the first Pete knew of the intentions of their hosts was when hard hands clamped onto him and dragged him out of the bed. Strong hands and arms held him while others placed handcuffs on his wrists. He heard Valentina's piteous wails and shrieks as other hard hands and strong arms imprisoned her. She continued to screech until the sound of a fist striking flesh ended her verbal protests. They were taken to the small municipal jail inside the police station. There was only one officer left. He decided to throw in with the township council when they deposed the now dead police chief a few days earlier. Tensions were still high. Some suggested that they go out into the countryside and hunt for game, but the counter argument was that animals had to be starving as well. If they lived, they had long since fled or turned into human eaters. The council had to get more people on board with their plan. They would not eat one another, but these two who'd stumbled into the settlements. Well, nobody knew them. They weren't real people, not citizens of their new civilization. Merely beggars who wanted to further drain the township's resources. Valentina sat next to Pete and cried. Her tears long since expended, she sobbed dryly into his chest. The officer and two other males came to get her. Pete fought as best he could, but the electronic control weapon still worked, and the officer shot the cables into him and zapped him repeatedly, far beyond what would have been allowed before order collapsed. Back when Pete could have threatened to own this stupid township, after the lawsuit he'd filed. In the end, Pete was left on the floor of the cell and had to remove the barbs from the weapon himself. He stayed on the floor for a long while and may have dozed, he was unsure. He slowly stood and tried to compose himself. Then he noticed that the party had closed the cell door but failed to lock it. The facility was old and outdated. It had no electronic locks. Pete looked around the station before he left. There were no firearms or other obvious weapons, so he made his way out of the station. He peered cautiously through the front glass doors and saw no one. He ducked outside and ran to the edge of the building. He stopped and composed himself. If he ran, he'd be noticed. He had to find and free Valentina and then get going. And then he vowed to himself, these small-town suburbanite weirdos will learn not to trifle with Pete Goldberg, attorney at law. He looked around as he walked into the rapidly deepening twilight darkness. He'd definitely been out for a while. There didn't seem to be anyone else outdoors. Likely they have a curfew, he thought. He circled the police station and courthouse complex to get a good look at the surrounding area and found that the little township had a community centre on the back side of the complex. 
He quickly realised that was where everyone already was or was headed, as he saw a few stragglers rush toward the main entrance, where they were ushered inside by stern-looking citizens who were ostensibly armed. He approached the building and circled the structure as he looked for a side or back entrance. He was rewarded when a back door near the dumpster proved to be unlocked. He made his way into the dark back room of the community centre. There were boxes and other containers piled all around him. He could see a bar of light glimmering beneath a door ahead. He paused at the door to listen. Pots and pans and people talking. Ah, a kitchen. They must be getting ready to make more of that community soup, he shuddered, as he, for the first time, wondered what type of creature had provided the meat and stock for the bowl he and Valentina had consumed. He waited until the voices faded, and then tried the doorknob. It opened. He let the door swing inward slightly, and shared the darkness with him, and then gazed through it into the brightly lit adjacent room. It was what he'd thought. A small kitchen. There was one figure still partially in the room, a plump woman with folds of flesh that had started to sag with her enforced diet. She stood in the doorway that led out into the main assembly hall and faced toward the meeting that had been called to order. Pete could hear people speaking but was more interested in locating Valentina and making their escape while the denizens of the township were occupied. Keeping a careful eye on the strapping woman, he stealthily looked around the kitchen. He needed a weapon. Then he saw the meat cleaver and a large kitchen knife, both still bloodied with whatever feast the cooks had prepared. He determined to take the knife. The cleaver was clearly only useful in the kitchen. The speaker in the other room raised his voice. He sounded like a preacher giving a sermon. Indeed, it was Reverend Hamilton Wright who spoke with such passion from the makeshift pulpit in the community centre. He was on the newly minted Township Council, and it was his duty to explain how the feast they were about to share was not an abomination, but rather a blessing, indeed a duty to their Lord, to survive and to continue to worship and sacrifice for him. Oh, Pete didn't pay attention to the quasi-sermon. He was busy creeping. Then, in the opposite corner, he saw a pile of familiar pink clothing, the nightgown Valentina had used, now somewhat bloodied and thrown into a heap. She would never have stood for that if she'd been able to. And then he stuffed the back of his hand into his mouth to contain a wretch, as he saw that on the counter that made up part of the corner was a piece that held long, dark, familiar hair. It was a scalp. It was hers. Pete squatted there, staring intently at the grisly trophy from the woman he loved. The hair that his hands had lovingly stroked so often. He choked back the scream that wanted desperately to escape from his throat, from his soul. He knew that he could do nothing for her, for his Valentina. Just maybe, maybe get revenge. But first he had to escape. The way was clear and the folks of the township were clearly occupied. This would be his only opportunity, heartless though it seemed, to leave her behind. He arose and made it to exit through the small storeroom. Behind him, the righteous reverend called on them all to feast in the name of the Lord. As the crowd cheered, Pete let forth his own internal scream of anguish. But it turned quickly to an actual scream of agony when the stout woman buried the cleaver in his shoulder. Eddie hunched in the storeroom of the school cafeteria. He and four other kids had been separated from their parents when the neighborhood tore itself apart over the last remaining groceries. The school had been closed for several days before the human conflagration, but Eddie and his friends had gone up to visit the playground. Now there were people fighting a battle between them and the way to their homes. They noticed that the doorways to the school were unlocked and decided to see if there was still some food left in the old storage area. Most of it had been raided by the cafeteria workers, but 
After weeks of thin rations, the kids were able to scrounge some overlooked items, a can of beets and another of green peas. After their feast, though, they'd heard outer doors crash open, and the sounds of shouting, angry voices, adult voices. Then a gunshot rang out, and they locked themselves in a storage closet. Many of the writers had supplemented their diets with alcoholic beverages. Why had they done so with intent and in moderation? Grain was grain, but the core members of the group did not comprehend that word, moderation. Now the alcohol-fueled rage of the mob had spilled into the last refuge of the innocent, the elementary school. Many of them had attended this school at one time, and so felt an irrational resentment toward the edifice. They tore at it for a while, able to do little damage to the child-proof structure. So in frustration, they set fire to the offices, to the now pointless reams of paper. Eddie and the others heard the fire alarm sound. They huddled together in fear as they crept from the closet. Then the sprinklers opened up and drenched them in cold, stale, stinking water, grown mouldy from years in the pipe. Well, that was enough to break their stupor. Like a herd before predators, they fled. They slipped and slided down the hallways in panic until they reached the rear entrance opposite the burning offices. They piled out into the vestibule and halted. Through the glass doors ahead, they could see the mayhem and madness of the rioting mob. Then Eddie saw a figure curled into a fetal ball just outside the front door. He recognised the poor kid, who'd clearly taken a severe beating. He opened the door and, with the help of his friends, pulled Jorge into the vestibule. He knelt beside the bigger boy, who looked up at him in terror. It's okay, Jorge. We got you. You're safe now. Sonia had packed her bags and her little toy dog and had flown to the Midwest to report on the locust plague. It was now time for her to jet back to the east coast and away from the increasing tensions in the now starving city. The food supply had dwindled and people had gone from afraid to frustrated to angry and now to insane. She walked in a very straightforward manner to the van that the local affiliate had lent to her crew. The flight they were about to take was one of the last of any kind available to go anywhere. It was a chartered commercial liner and they hadn't even offered first-class accommodations. They drove past a line of people outside a grocery warehouse. There was no food available at retail, and very little now available at any price. The armed warehouse workers, come gang members, exacted enormous tolls for the merest scraps, and people gladly paid what they could just to get enough to hang on for a few more days. Sonia sniffed in distaste. Oh, I'll be so glad to get back to civilization. Well, this place wasn't great to start with. Now it's a downright zoo. And the animals are in charge. Maybe it's become more of a circus. They made it to the airport with time to spare, but found that the gates to the terminal were blocked by a large crowd of people who'd had flights cancelled from under them. They were nearly at a riot stage. There was no food left at the airport, and many of them had been stuck there for days. Far from home and resources, desperate to reach home to families and loved ones, it was a bubbling cauldron of humanity, pressed and packed into an ever more confined space. The three news crew members surrounded Sonia and her little dog and began to force their way through the crowd. The biggest crew member, whom the others secretly called Big Fat Bob, led the way, and when a few people in the crowd staggered into his path, he shoved a couple of them. There was no point to it. They had nowhere to go in the press of bodies. After a while, the small party was nearly unable to forge any further ahead. The crowd was simply packed in too tightly at the last open gate, the one that they needed, the one for which they had tickets. They managed to work their way forward at a snail's pace, Sonia all the time remarking on why these literally great unwashed masses were behaving in such a selfish, uncouth manner. When they made it to the gate, armed officers greeted them. The people at the edge of the crowd resentfully let them through. 
They showed their special passes, and there was some attempt at screening them. Two of the crew members carried large camera bags as carry-on luggage, and Sonia, of course, had her personal bag, complete with its nervous little occupant, who, unbeknownst to Sonia, had urinated on most of her belongings while they navigated the crowd. And they checked everything else with the lone baggage handler at the ticket counter. Then someone in the crowd noticed the little dog that had peered curiously from Sonia's shoulder bag. Hey, that woman's taken a dog on the plane. There's no room for more people, but you'll let that dog go? Most people couldn't see the dog and thus comprehend how ridiculous the statement was. Their resentment and hunger had been building for far too long to submit to mere reason. Someone else shouted, Hey, if those jerks would leave some bags, then another person or two could fit on board. Well, the mob's IQ plummeted with every further screech until a large man at the front yelled, Hey, rush him! and followed his own advice. So did the rest of the mass of humanity. Sonia and two of her crew were lifted into the air by the wave of pressing bodies, like so much flotsam on the tide. Big Fat Bob, heavy as he was, rode the wave for a short time, but then sank beneath the trampling feet of the herd. The little dog cowered inside the shoulder bag, now dropped and kicked over to rest against a wall. Just as he scampered out of the bag, a young girl scooped him up and the bag and crouched in the corner of a pillar embedded in the wall as the crowd passed them. Her new best friend peeked out of the bag for a quick lick of her face, and duck back inside to safety. The world continued to tear itself apart for months until finally there was no one left who was able to fight and no resources over which to strive. Disease set in amongst the large population centres where bodies lay rotting in the streets, at least those that hadn't made it into cookpots. And yet, the earth healed. People brought in what seeds they could, and the spring buds grew in the northern hemisphere as the fall buds bloomed in the southern. It was a struggle, but after seven long years, the 2.8 billion remaining Homo sapiens stopped the plummet into savagery and chaos. While it would be a while before they could rise, they greatly slowed the fall and knew that with cooperation they would level off and regain some stability. No one spoke much about the horrors of the first few years, or if they did, they whispered and shuddered in disgust at their own actions. Amos had died in year two from heart failure. Nathan had disappeared shortly thereafter. He said something about going down to the Gulf Coast. AJ and Madison each found spouses and settled into farm life with the new seeds that their plants had finally produced and from those that had been stored before the locusts arrived. Many trees survived, and even some wildlife had managed to make it. They once more had cattle and goats and chickens in large enough numbers that they could sell some of the excess products, at least to their neighbours. No point wasting it on the cannibal savages in the cities. Jorge's family had not made it through the riot. Eddie's had and adopted the boy, along with several other lost children. Things had been tough. They'd done things, eaten things, that no one wanted to remember, that caused them to avert or lower their eyes when even a mention was required. Yet the kids had almost all made it to their teens and beyond. Eddie and Jorge shook hands and then embraced as the brothers they become. Eddie was headed off to the Citizen's Watch Academy. He decided to serve with the entity that had replaced the police and other first responders in their area. He'd finally gotten his own growth spurt, and it was fortunate for Jorge that Eddie was not one to hold grudges. In the far north of Canada, Sam Walker and the other two members of his team of researchers stalked along a game trail formed by animals that had survived when the locusts decided to disappear and had left behind enough plant life that it had actually flourished. It had even begun to spread to friendlier climes to the south. He and his team had been left relatively unscathed, since he'd been in a government control facility before the disaster and its immediate aftermath. The team was now assigned 
to the search for locusts. It was paramount that they find where the insects had gone to ground. They and other scientists deemed worthy of protection had researched the many small corpses left behind when the creatures had flown into vehicle grills or hard structures head first. They were definitely not a known species of locust, but their habits were similar. Well, they huffed and puffed as they crossed the latest hills and stared down toward the crevasse that was their destination. According to the information they had, the split in the earth likely contained caves and holes and other possible hiding places. As they cautiously approached the edge of the drop, he turned to his two companions, both of whom looked exhausted. Do you hear that? They each stopped and cocked their heads to listen more closely. It sounded like buzzing and chittering and clacking. The noises of vast numbers of chitinous bodies rubbing together. We found them! William exclaimed in excitement. Ah, the theories have proven true. Amazing that they're alive after so many years in this environment. Well, after all, they started in hot, dry climates, in deserts. William had time for a short shriek, followed by a hideous gurgle before the flesh was stripped from his bones. His companions fared no better and joined him in their short shrieks and gurgles as a swarm of carnivorous locusts that had metamorphosed over the past seven years engorged themselves after their initial waking and then formed into an enormous cloud and swarmed forth in hunger. So, my dear friends, we're all on lockdown thanks to the coronavirus, but, well, as I think we see from tonight's story, things could be a lot, lot worse. Locusts, eh? Don't we just hate them? Damn locusts! No, 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 I don't want a plague of locusts. Let me deal with the virus and I'll take my chances. Oh dear, well, things come and things go, but we're still here, and I will always be here to entertain you. Stuck inside the house? Listen to my back catalogue. I've got 500 plus stories for you to listen to. Those of you who've already listened to all of them, <laughs> there are a few of you, try listening to them all again. Always new stuff from me to keep you going through these difficult times. Well, that's enough for me for one night, but especially tonight, very, very sweet dream. Some bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>